hot. <laughs> yeah. It's really warm here. Mm -hmm. We are live. And we are live. Isn't that <laughs> wonderful? Yes. Well, welcome everyone. This is See Black Woman, See Black Women, See Us, part two. And uh, I have the gift of being able to sit and circle again with four beautiful Black women artists in the Bay Area. My name is Ashara Ikundayo. I'm an independent curator and arts organizer and cultural strategist. I live in Oakland, California. Um, we are in the midst of sheltering in place, still mm, somewhat in California, but definitely in Oakland. And for those of us who are supporting um, in solidarity with physical distancing, but not with emotional, spiritual, uh, or intellectual distancing, we are honored to have the opportunity to speak again tonight um, with my dear ones who are arts organizers, uh, educators, practicing artists, friends, and sisters. I wanna first acknowledge the land that we're on here in the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area, that this is the unceded land of the Muwekma Ohlone and Ransom Ohlone people and their nation. Unceded means that the First Nations people did not and have not ever relinquished this land to the government by treaty or otherwise. The first language spoken on this land is called Chuchengyo. And so with respect to the land and the indigenous people of this land, we wanna honor those who came before us, those who are here, those who are coming. We want to honor that the Ohlone are still here, that their language is still, is still here and that the land is loved. If there is, um, so thank you. Thank you for stewarding that. And we uh, walk gently upon this land with permission. The little bit of housekeeping that we have is if you happen to be joining us on Facebook or YouTube, you can make comments along the, on the way. You can ask questions at any time and we'll try to get to those either throughout the conversation or at the end of the Q&A. If you wanna just watch without making comments or seeing any comments, you can watch on the ybca.org website and just hit events and it'll take you to this live stream. And I guess um, as we get started, I wanna invite us to take a breath, you know, to just, yeah, you know, just take a breath with each other and, and, and for all of the, the beings that are on this planet breathing deeply, you know, still breathing. I'll say again that if you're just joining us, this is See Black Women Part Two. This is a forum featuring Bay Area Black women artists and curators. It is co-presented by Art in Action, the Museum of the African Diaspora, and the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. As part of our Art in Action YBCA, come to your census, Who Counts in America, which is an art and civic experience now happening online. The five of us will be in conversation for about 50 minutes or so with about 15 minutes of Q&A. And at the end of our conversation, I'll thank all of our partners and collaborators, including the wonderful folks who are like managing this, this uh, conversation through technology today. So in the practice of seeing each other, I wanna invite our panelists to speak their names and to enter, you know, enter the, the names of their comrades uh, to introduce each other. And so with that, we're going to start with Sam Vernon. Thank you, Shara, for inviting me into this conversation. I'm deeply honored to be with all of you and the audience. I also am very happy to introduce my sister and just found out neighbor, Asia Abdaman. Asia's pronouns are she, her, and they, them. Asia was born in Asmara, Eritrea. Asmia is the grandchild of Fatima and Otia. And when I think of Asmia, um, as Asia, and how powerful she is. I am aware of how artists understand the relationship between culture 
human rights, and environmental protection. Asia's work promotes cultural and ecological survival, bringing new perspectives and resources to local audiences. Asia is concerned with food, water, power, and shelter as concepts and how they can be brought to us as visual notes. She shared with me that she feels that every material is sacred and that black women have always helped her along her journey. I'm very happy to have, uh, to have spoken with her also about her background, which she describes as nomadic, matriarchal, and full of medicine and art. So I'm very, very happy to be in this conversation with Asya. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. That was so sweet. Um, I'm introducing, oh, and thank you, Ashara, for having me here. And I'm super honored to be with each of you. I was, uh, I met earlier with um, Tahira Rashid, and I'm introducing my sister, Tahira Rashid. She was born in West Oakland. Oh, she goes by any pronoun. And for me, I'm more comfortable with saying she. So um, I'm going to move forward with that. Um, she was born in West Oakland. Tahira is the grandchild of Clementine Smith, born in Depew, Oklahoma, on the Choctaw Reservation, and the grandchild of Adeline Jackson, also born on the Choctaw Reservation. When she thinks of them, she thinks of strength and perseverance. Tahira is the, is the daughter of former Black Panther Party members. Tahira is an activist, a lover of music and dance. Tahira loves to travel and lived in other countries, China, Peru, and Mexico. Tahira loves to sail. Tahira loves water. Tahira is a published medical ethnobotany researcher after living and working in Peru. She studied under Dr. Lee Rayford, Dr. Ula Taylor, Dr. VV, or Veve Clark, and Lindsay Herbert in the Discourse of African American Studies. Tahira's father died of liver cancer, and that's where her medical journey ended and her study on death and grieving began. Tahira is a survivor of an 8.2 earthquake in Peru and Hurricane Katrina. Bahara is a friend to many, and I'm very happy and honored to have her as a new friend. Thank you. That was really lovely. Um, thank you, Ashara, for moderating this panel for See Black Women, um, YBCA, Art in Action, Amy, Brittany, all of you behind the scenes. Um, I have the honor and pleasure of being amongst, it, amongst you all. Um, in virtual land, and I have the honor and privilege of introducing my sister, my comrade, Lucasa Branchman Betty Simo. Um, her gender, her pronouns are she and her. She was born in New York City, New York. She is the grandchild of Joao Betty Simo, Sabiche Dos Santos, and Claire. Branchman and Ruben Branchman, and the child of Suchi Branchman and Carlos Verissimo. Um, I first had the pleasure and honor of being in the presence of Lucasa in the fall of 2015 at the Nook Gallery, which also happened to be her home, which also um, says a lot about who she is as a person. And that when I think of Lucasa, I think about her ability to make things accessible. Um, I believe that Lucasa is younger than I, and I just wanna honor um, the people younger than myself, the women younger than myself, doing these amazing things um, and the way that you make um, your art accessible and visible. I want to honor the way in which you are an activist. Um, I've been um, put in the pleasure of your company and the the Moms for Housing campaign. I've seen you on the street in many protests in Oakland. Um, your art and activism and your, your 
your activism in disability justice um, says a lot about who you are. And the first time that I was honored to be in your presence at the Nook Gallery, um, you made and screen printed these shirts that said, take care of, and there was a list of all the people. And so that says a lot about Lucasa Branchman, Betty Simo, and it's an honor to be able to introduce you today and to be spoken in the same sentence and on this panel with you this evening. Thank you, T. I'm blown away. I'm trying to keep myself together. Um, so honored to be in community with all of you. Um, thank you, Ashara, for bringing us here together. I'm kind of like tricking myself into just thinking of this as a love fest so that I don't freak out. Um, so, so, so honored to be here with everyone. Um, and I feel really honored um, to be introducing Sam, um, who is a dear mentor and colleague and friend and huge inspiration to me as a practicing artist, as an educator, as an activist, um, as someone who gives me force and gives us all the force to continue. Sam Vernon uses she, her, they, them pronouns. They were born in Brooklyn, New York. Sam is the grandchild of Dolores and Danny Merrow and Livoya Vernon and Walter Vernon. When I think of Sam, they remind me of the power and the force that we hold as black queer women, educators, artists, thinkers, in the classroom, in the studio, in the gallery, in the institutional space, in the non-institutional space, in the streets, a true force um, and person to call a friend and a comrade and a colleague. Um, so thank you so much for letting me share this space with you um, here and beyond this virtual form. Um, Ashe to everyone and what everyone brought into this space. I'm looking forward to being in conversation. Ashe, thank you very much. It's so, it's so good to gather, as we say, as, as the women gather at the water, this is uh, a gathering of sorts as we live into this, this new era that we're in. Before we started the call, I know you all had asked, how did I how did I curate the space? How did I invite and decide who was going to be part of the conversation? And at first, I, I think I answered that it was somewhat random and that I had put you know, some of the schedule together based on your availability. But really, it comes back to the fact that I have designated all of you as artists, as first responders, that this designation, uh, this destination, this conversation and exhibition uh, and the work that you all create is the work in your practices, save lives and heal communities. And so this platform that I've been authoring for this time, uh, you all are a representative of that, as well as um, more people, more women, more comrades and siblings and kindred that we hope to continue the conversation with. So I just, I thank you for your practice and I'm excited to get into it today. And you know, it's really just us, it's like, the four of us, you know, we're more well, the five of us, the five of us, including me. And so, yeah, we're just gonna take another breath. Um, that said, the four themes for our time together are around our black women's legacy on being seen and heard and counted, uh, on art making inside of this worldwide cataclysmic paradigm shift, on redesigning and designing repositories for collective grief and collective joy, and on the notion that Black women are allowed to be happy and free. Yeah? So we're gonna get into that. So the overarching message and the invitation of this forum and newly formed curatorial and artistic collective is to see Black women. And to not only see us with your physical eyes or with the eyes that you use to like des des designate something, but also to hear black women, to trust black women, to love black women, protect black women and to pay black women. 
in our centering of our lives, ideas, and labor. In a year where bodies are being counted and families and households are being counted through the census and in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic, can each of you share your thoughts on the politics of bodies and ideas being seen and celebrated and or ideas and bodies being masked, pun intended? And also, is there a particular call to action inside of our See Black Women Manifesto that resonates with your upbringing or the values that are infixed in your own consciousness? You wanna start, does someone want to start? I, yeah, I see. I saw your hair. I saw your. I see you. Okay. All right. So for me, I'm laughing at this time because um, scarves were banned, covering faces were banned. I was banned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. so um, to see the whole world cover up. You know, I have a neighbor who's fully covered in black, and when I saw her, I said, "Hey." The word for covering is called niqab, and I was like, "Hey, the whole world is now a niqabi. You're no longer outlawed." You know, so I laughed. I thought it was funny, but she took the moment as like it's very serious. I've I've been born in so many um, crises that to me this is a normal moment. So, mm. Mm. yes. So, you know, as we as so many people on the planet have been practicing Ramadan and have come through Ramadan with bling and light and beauty, uh, I've been thinking a lot about you and thinking a lot about my friends who cover you know, my sisters who cover and how we have become um, a culture that is covered in all kinds of ways and that the covering and the mask has become a fashion statement as well. And part of the, what has been in the past unseen labor, you know, yeah. of, of many people, of brown women in particular, our unseen labor of creating masks and covering to protect ourselves and to protect other people. Uh, T, I'm wondering if you, you'd like to to add to this conversation at this point and give me your thoughts. Yeah, um, definitely my thoughts are um, thinking about the cover of the New York Times and the names of the people um, who have died and seeing it in print and it being delivered um, to the front doors and to the faces of people in their, in their face right now. And I'm thinking about the mass graves. Um, mm -hmm. Last week I attended three Zoom funerals and um, I'm thinking about the way we are mediating death through technology and uh, what we are not seeing even more so. And I think about the disparity, the health disparity in the African-American community being affected by COVID and that's not being seen and those numbers are not being exposed and ran across on the bottom of the TV screens and being that my, my background is in medicine or um, was to go into medicine and doing research and studying viruses and bacteria in Peru, I think about how we are not seen in pandemics like the HIV pandemic that is still a pandemic, Black women. Mm -hmm. um, Black women are still the most affected by that pandemic now. And, you know, right now I am hoping to um, be calling for mutual aid efforts to continue, um, specifically, um, yeah, the call to activate more mutual aid and, and that that continues um, in my community and to activate um, folks to continue that work and a part of the manifesto to pay Black women healthcare, um, access to healthcare, um, uh, rent, uh, you know, these demands that are necessary right now. Um, so that's what I'm, I'm thinking about. I'd like to add to the conversation. And also thinking my background and being raised Muslim, coming from Islam and seeing people cover up. But yeah, it's, um, it's definitely, I agree with Asya, that it's, it's something to see right now as the world now covers up when we were once banned. Mm. Thank you. Sam, do you have some thoughts for this, this part of the, the conversation, the politics of being seen, being invisible, being masked, being covered, our work? 
Yeah, I was just on a walk earlier today and I got so many stares because I was wearing dark sunglasses and my mask at the same time. And I usually like do one or the other, but I did both today because it was so bright and sunny outside and, you know, just so many people kind of wondering about me and it brought up a lot of um, that story that that's circulating ar around um, Amy Cooper calling the police on uh, Mr. Cooper who just wanted her to be mindful of her dog. The Audubon Society came out with a statement and they said, Black Americans often face terrible daily dangers in outdoor spaces where they are subjected to unwarranted suspicion, confrontation, and violence. The outdoors and the joy of birds should be safe and welcoming for all people. I mean, <laughs> one of the major places that we had when all this happened uh, was you know, the, the outdoors, like, you know, we, we were at least invited. So, so-called invited to an, enjoy a walk or, um, you know, here in the Bay area, we have so many beautiful destinations to go to. Um, but outside of our neighborhoods, we're still, um, being suspected inside and outside of our neighborhoods. We're being suspected of wrongdoing and being called out. I think this is really on my mind right now. Uh, where can we find safe space inside and outside of our homes, given the phase one, two, three, four, et cetera, of how things are opening up. This is extremely problematic and needs to be addressed because as a black person who enjoys nature, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, to be a suspect, whether I'm walking to get a sandwich or going to actually like put my toes in the water, if it feels uh, if it, it it feels like eyes are on me right now if I'm wearing a mask. So, just wanted to add that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for adding that into this conversation. I feel a thing that we're all thinking about on the daily basis. Um, I, yeah, keep going back to the list, the manifesto of see black women and going back to the, the word, the sentence that says trust black women. Um, and just thinking about all the ways that our systems and societies are built on the care and the work of black women, of black bodies, of black and brown bodies and, and what does it mean to trust and see us and to recognize these bodies and the work that's going on and just thinking about thinking about recognition, thinking about who gets thanked for the work that they do, who gets trusted, who's believed in at this moment. Um, and just how important it is to honor and believe in those bodies, in those voices, in those people, um, in the folks that keep our world alive. Um, and what does trust really look like? And how can I, you know, how can folks go for a walk and trust and know that we're just going for a walk with our sunglasses on and our mask on because we care? about our community and trust us that we are humans too. Um, the trust in knowing that we should be alive, that knowing that we should say, I can't breathe and trust us that we can't, that we can say that, that we're speaking the truth. Um, yeah, to trust black women, to trust that our lives are important and that we are the backbone to keeping this country, this world alive, um, and to trust that our, our bodies and our safety is important right now. So um, yeah, just going back to that line, 
um, that prioritization of our bodies in this world and to trust us, really, the emphasis on trust. That's what I'm thinking about right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. There's a, a question uh, that's in the, the chat from Sophia. First of all, saying, of course, that you all are amazing because you are, but they're curious to see if this pandemic impacting both negatively and positively, if you believe that there will be some thought on how it will impact the visibility of black women who are artists. Okay. Can I start? Yeah, of course. Okay. So um, when it comes to seeing us, I think we're seen in like a negative light a lot of times. Um, and our appearances are appropriated by others and it's seen as if that's their culture. Um, but I think the way that this pandemic affects us is if we were in the mainstream, it's a, it becomes that we are in a lot of danger in a lot more danger because people are in a state of fear. While they're in the state of fear, they're going to be picking on what is the lowest of the totem pole, what is the low, what is considered the lowest of society, and that would be black women. You know, so um, it makes us more in danger. When I go for walks now, because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit more hyper vigilant. Earlier this month, I was attacked at a grocery store um, by, you know, a worker there. So since then, I've come out with, you know, I go out with a walking stick. And I notice not many people approach you or do anything to you when you have something like that in your hand. Um, but yeah, I think that in this time, the collective reaction will be to, um, we're gonna be in more danger than we've ever been in. And usually I'm very positive, but in this I'm extremely pessimistic um, that we need to have more care when we're out and about. And we need to um, be aware that other people's fears are gonna be projected more so on on black women than others. And how it benefits us during the um, pandemic is that um, for those of us that are already been on the outside, um, though we've been on the fringes of society, we continue on living our lives as we were. You know, that's, that's what I think. Um, if I can add to that and answer that question as well. Um, thank you, Sophia, for that. Um, I think, Race is, is omnipresent and operates in a system that continues to uphold um, racist and specifically gendered institutional institutionalized practices. And those have severe consequences for black women who are practicing um, various forms of art and um, in how we're seen predominantly in faces that are not predominantly um, of black women. So. There is a there is a threat, um, and just how you know Sam mentioned how she was being seen um, and not trusted, as essentially Lupeza added on. So there's a there is a call to protect Black women and to also just be um, aware of those very real um, institutionalized structures and systems in place. Um, that have always been in place and um, recognizing the black women who get the brunt of that. And a part of seeing black women is protecting um, black women, knowing and um, actively engaging in um, the, the needs that um, as of right now, like wearing a mask, um, I'm someone who has asthma and have a lot of anxiety at the moment of even as things open up, I will still be sheltered in place because this is not something I can expose myself to. And um, I'm someone who actively participates in mutual aid efforts and engaging with the community um, and in doing um, a mural and window displays, for example, with my comrade, um, Sonia Cabello in North Oakland. Um, you know, there's very real threat in how we're able to um, visibly represent um, the community, Black women, people of color, and do art um, at this time. So it's, we are definitely um, affected by COVID-19 right now in very real ways. Mm -hmm. T, I wanna, I wanna invite you to just expand a little bit more on the work that you, you spoke about in North Oakland 
uh, here in California with critical resistance and um, the work that you've been stewarding in terms of conversations around women who are part of the prison industrial complex and the work to abolish prisons um, and eradicate uh, the industrial complex. Can you can you talk just a little bit more about that and, and then we'll talk if sure. anyone else wants um, to ask a question. But. I'm the building project manager for Critical Resistance New Headquarters in North Oakland 4400 Telegraph. And as I mentioned, I'm working with my comrade and partner, Danya Cabello. Uh, we are a grassroots organization and we believe in abolishing the prison industrial complex. Um, one, one effort right now um, we're reporting is the refilling of the Zachary project, which is also a, a mutual aid project that we run and we give um, up to $500 out to folks. But um, specifically with being counted, um, folks in who, who are imprisoned, um, often we hear about um, men in prison or mostly private prisons and um, hardly ever about women in prison, which is, um, extreme, it, the number is very high and black women account for the majority of folks in prison, in women's prisons and receive a lot of uh, real dangerous threats and violence. And uh, as far as the census, uh, those, they are counted in the census where they are imprisoned. And that is, um, you know, really important to think about because that is where the money is going, mm -hmm. not where they previously last lived. Mm -hmm. Um, so being counted and having, you know, taking the sentence census is very important, um, because there's a lot of money that is, that will be raised in your community or not raised will be afforded to your community by each person that takes a census up to $20,000 per person, um, that participates in that, um, I think would help with providing funds for those strat those abolitionist strategies and um, eliminating the prison industrial complex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, before we go on, uh, Lucasa or Sam, did you wanna add anything to the second part of the question? Yeah, I'm just, um kind of riffing off what T has been talking about and thanks again for all your work. So, so in solidarity with that important work right now. Um, and just thinking about like the shifts and you know, the impact of artists at this time, I think the impact is, how is this pa pandemic impacting us? It's always, the pandemic of capitalism, the pandemic of white supremacy is always affecting us. Um, it's just now that these things are becoming a little bit more visible to those who maybe aren't looking closely at them always. Um, but I've been thinking a lot about the kind of this term that you've coined, Ashara, the artist as first responder and the ways in which it feels like artists at this moment are kind of not unlike we often do, but stepping into these spaces of mutual aid, these spaces of care for our community and just, um, you know, thinking about the importance and the, and the care work that's going on between this, the people in this conversation today and also kind of the role of the artists as being called in, in moments of emergency um, mm -hmm. to, be, be at the table to make um, decisions happen, to demand for accessibility or different ways of approaching and looking at emergencies. Um, and just, yeah, just been sitting with that artist as first responder kind of um, phrase for a little bit. It, it feels so, it feels so natural. It's like, we're, we're there. We're there, we're called in at 6 a.m. in the morning. I'm there yeah. in my pajamas, yes. you know? Like I'm there to come and workshop and brainstorm what abolition can look like um, throughout our world, in the studio, in the classroom, in the gallery. Um, so just the importance of 
calling in artists at this moment and calling in black artists at this moment. Mm -hmm. Indeed, the culture shifts, therefore the cultural workers show up first. We stand up first. Um, I want to I want to presence that uh, Lucasa, you called to our attention uh, at YBC at, at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts to figure out how we can provide closed captioning for these conversations and how that uh, invitation for the arts institution, this museum, to be relevant and to be accessible, to be more accessible in their work and their the I think their call to uh, examine power their call to examine privilege and access. Um, and so you as an, as an organizer, as an artist, called that to our attention. And so that, that's happening right now because of you. And so I just wanna acknowledge that and cite black women, as we know, is another call to, to action and um, definitely show some uh, acknowledgement and shout out to the organizers who have brought that to our lips uh, and that work to the platform as well. I also wanna, put a shout out for all the amazing disability justice folks of color that have influenced my work in advocating for closed captioning and a um, multitude of accessible ways. So it's, it's thanks to them too. And that's what I was talking about in Lucas's intro of her taking care of, of folks and making things and platforms accessible, prime example. Just yeah. wanted to throw that in there. Yeah. Sam, did you want to add anything? And you, you don't know, have to. Um, I, I just want to say like we're higher education is having a moment. Mm. <laughs> um, Talk about it. We are, <laughs> mm. we are in, we are in the thick of it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so um, I am really trying to bring my energy and focus to both my undergrad and graduate uh, classes, colleagues, students, um, the environment that we wanna create both online and in-person social distancing in the fall and next year is something that I think pertains to a lot of um, artists and educators uh, practicing in the Bay Area at this time, there are so many artist teachers, so many uh, folks who work with not only higher ed, but K through 12 um, uh, populations. How do we um, really look at the blind spots mm -hmm. and address the fact that black folks specifically um, single black mothers who are raising their children may or may not have um, the access to what is needed via technology or space to um, keep education available and consistent for their children. Uh, this is an equity issue. You know, uh, it's, it's not only for, you know, really, really, you know, vulnerable populations, but it's, it's, only, it's also for the educators like myself who are, who are asking how do we balance our studio practice with mm -hmm. our, our teaching methodologies, right? So this is affecting every level of education um, as we know it. Uh, I am really trying to zero in on that uh, uh, I know that artists have so much power in the classroom and within institutions, public, private combinations. Um, how, how do we bring our agency to the folks that make decisions about advocacy um, for students and for um, staff mm. who have been furloughed and um, faculty who are having to rise to the occasion to adapt for online learning environments. So um, that's, that's where I've been mm -hmm. on this. Yeah, those are good questions. Um, we can try to, try, to unpack, uh, try to unpack a little bit of that. Um, I wanna move into this conversation around your art making, specifically your art making inside of this catacomb 
cataclysmic paradigm shift. I'm going to read um, read something from Black woman scholar writer Sadia Hartman has noted that every generation confronts the task of choosing its past. Inheritances are chosen as they are passed on. The past depends less on what happened then than on than as much as on what happened then, than on the desires and discontents of the present. As each of you are considering and create your work in this new era, are you envisioning or witnessing any shifts in your practice, in your materials, um, in your technique? And, and in that, you've started to talk about this, but describe your hopes for the artistic and the creative sector for funding as we, like, we witness some very deep uh, cuts, very deep changes in policy um, for institutions as well as artists who depend on philanthropic dollars uh, to, you know, to fuel, to fuel their livelihood and to fuel their art practice. Are you seeing any shifts in your work, in your technique, and how you make your work? Since everyone's thinking, I'll go first. <laughs> um, um, the shift for me is that I closed my studio last year. I, you know, I had a feeling that this was going to be a very rough year, and you know, when I get that kind of feeling, I unload. You know, so I quit everything and I drop all engagements because I don't know what I'm coming into. So I'd like to come with both hands, you know, empty and ready to deal with what's ahead of me. And so in closing my studio, I missed being able to make my work like this and making huge messes and all of that. But what happened is that I shifted into um, a digital world of like making collages of all my past works. And in, in this month of Ramadan, having a lot of time of silence and reflection, um, you know, I don't know, it seemed like I went into a trance and then all of this new kinds of work just started appearing from the old work. So, um, and then, cause I wanted to actually, I noticed all the boarded up buildings and originally I wanted to paint things, but I'm like, I'm too tired. I don't want to physically, you know, put up anything. And so I thought, you know what, if I project something on it, this is a time of darkness. And what you need in times of darkness is a whole lot of light to contrast what's going on. So yeah, so I made things that could be projected. My plan is to cover City Hall and the White House, you know, in everywhere with the artwork. Oh, did you guys hear me? Was I muted the whole time? No, I heard you just fine. We heard you. <laughs> okay, now I'm ready. I, I mute myself because I have a train that goes by okay. the front door. So all right. I, I mute when you all are talking. Asiya, did you do you have some thoughts around or your hopes for the art sector, you know, in these this big shift here around how it's funded and how we're funded and how we gather relational aid, you know, so we can call it mutual aid, but it's about relationships and Yes, um, all for mutual aid. I'm actually working on creating cooperatives. So the first one is a grocery one because I need to eat. Um, but after that one, the next one is to create, um, you know, alliances with collaborations on um, cooperatives within the creative industry. So I think this time we have like a huge reshuffling happening. And so we have a chance to shuffle ourselves to the top and actually get funded because we bring a lot to this um, world. We bring a lot of benefits. And in the past, we were never paid properly. So I see this as a window of opportunity to kind of like jump to the top and ensure that we have fair payment and what we consider fair payment, not what is established for us for the works that we have. So anything that we do, I think we should, um, you know, collectively, like maybe even come up with a manifesto you know, that these are our demands. I was talking to Sam earlier, or is it Rashida? I think it's, I mean, uh, Tahira. Tahira um, about um, how artists discount themselves in not um, accept, in accepting no pay, you know, working for so much exposure that you end up, you know, becoming homeless because of the passion. And that makes no kind of sense. So enough, we had enough exposure. We don't need any more exposure. We need pay. Yes. T, do you want to add uh, to this? Yeah, if I could just add to that, I think um, I'm shifting and creating um, networks and relationships with folks and like the effort of the um, artist 
um, art auction in the fall um, that I'm organizing. And I think it's important that we recognize artists at this time for the cultural keepers that they are, that the work that they do and reflecting um, the struggles of our time. And also that we um, are recognizing that that work <laughs> needs to be paid for as well and how important that is. Um, it's extremely, it's, it's, it's just the time that we start to look inward and that we are able to truly understand how important artists are right now, just hands down. That is, we need, artists are the heart and will keep us going. And if we, the faster and the sooner we recognize that, I think the better off we will survive this terrible time that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. Sam? Well, I, I would just refer back to uh, Fred Moten when he was in conversation with uh, Mr. Gates and um, oh, Ms. Gates. Brown. Yeah, um, when he talked them. about displacement. Um, right now, displacement is happening on multiple levels. We have students not sure if they're going to go back to school. Uh, we have people not sure if they're going to go back to work or already know that they've lost positions. Um, we have uh, folks who don't know if they're going to be able to pay their rent. Um, we have folks that are unsure about their health care um, and whether or not they will be able to uh, keep it if, if, if they don't keep their jobs or if their jobs are vulnerable or if they don't have uh, the money to afford it. So right now there are, there's a lot <laughs> of displacement happening. Uh, displacement, we know, uh, disproportionately affects black women. But what I've found is, what I found hope in is that uh, myself and others who are deeply invested in helping other black women are bonding we're coming together and we're saying, how do we help each other? We're not just looking at Susus here, you know, <laughs> we're like, we're thinking about, you know, big overarching needs and partnerships that can be established with already existing organizations, uh, folks who are invested in the community, degree or not, homeowner or not, you know, uh, folks that um, are unhoused or folks that have had housing for many years. The, 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 the binaries are being destroyed because mm -hmm. of this. Mm -hmm. How are you, <laughs> you know? navigating as a, as a printmaker, as a printmaker, you know, an installation artist, how are you navigating the shift? Is there a, a practice pivot that you've made? In your work, I'm I'm noting that really beautiful print of yours that's behind your head. Ah, oh, thanks. Uh, like... Lucasa had something to do with this. <laughs> um, yeah, um, this this is a, an image of mine that was published by Wolfman, which is a artist run, incredibly uh, important uh, bookstore publishing house in in Oakland. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Lucasa and others who are uh, involved in Wolfman books. Uh, these Wolfman is an example of the kind of organization that artists can partner with in the Bay Area to get their writing out there, get their images out there, get their ideas, concepts, activism, the the whole gamut into mm -hmm. a publication that reaches folks both in print and online. Um, I think that these are the kinds of partnerships that have been invaluable to me as someone who did not grow up here. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, an East Coast person that, that migrated over here about three years ago. But, you know, as a transplant, I've been welcomed because I think the trust that I've built with folks allows me to use my work 
my agency, my platform um, to spread knowledge and awareness about what the heck is going on here, you know, and, and what we need to be invested in um, uh, along this journey, uh, especially now because of, of the disparities rising um, and, and becoming uh, prob even, even more problematic perhaps than they were before. Uh, so, so how has my work been affected? Astronomically. Do I want to get on the, on, on, on the, uh, the, the BART to get to my studio? I mean, <laughs> that's been- The BART is the, is the train. Yeah, it's the MTA, it's, it's, it's yeah, the light rail. It's, here. It's yeah. It's like it's it's hard to it's it's hard to navigate. But um, I I think that we you know I've gotten so much encouragement even from um, Azia earlier when she was saying you know I come from a background that's out uh, that I I view myself as an outsider artist. You know I I as a refugee I've been through so many things. Even her story encourages me to know that we can get through this you know, together, um, supporting each other. So mm -hmm. that, that's, uh, that's what I'm looking at. There's a, a question uh, in the group room about white privilege. Uh, I, I wanna add white supremacy and as it being something that we live with, live within, grapple with, uh, fight back against. And there's a question on how we as black women protect our mental well being. Uh, as we're moving into the next uh, part of the conversation, I want to invite Lucasa to to speak first, um, and then start to talk a little bit about how we design repositories for collective grief and joy in this in this time. Yeah, I think I will answer that question. Also, the question before about the shift within our own practice, and I'm you know, going back to, I mean, shift is an understatement, um, but thinking more about kind of the, I'm gonna like loosely use the word pause or the ways in which um, we as artists is kind of like, things never stop and yet this feels like a moment in which we're allowed to fully breathe and full, allowed to fully live almost. I feel like as an artist in the Bay Area, I'm constantly working. I'm constantly hustling within my practice. Um, I'm making work. I'm like producing, producing, producing and not always allowed the space um, and the time um, to pause and take care of my well-being and closely examine what it means to be an artist right now, what it means to be a black queer woman artist in the Bay Area, um, ways in which institutions kind of, kind of pressure, pressure, put us in moments and places of pressure to produce. Um, and that has been a big shift in this moment right now as I'm kind of stepping back from mass production um, and stepping into other ways of ca collective care and mutual aid and support um, kind of in ways that I feel like I'm not often able to fully show up in. Um, I am just gonna glance at that question again. Um, yeah, I mean, I think with saying that, that kind of goes into what does it look like for my well-being. I think it's a lot, a, a huge demand um, on artists, on um, Black women artists in the Bay Area to be, to be producing, to be on, to, you know, we're producing because we have to, because I have to pay my rent. Um, I'm producing because I love it, but also because this system demands a lot from us. Um, and I, as much as I feel overwhelmed by this moment, I also feel like it's it's kind of like opening up these possibilities of what well-being sh should look like for art. Like what does sustainability for artists look like? 
Um, mm -hmm. What does well-being of the survival of artist-run spaces look like? Like, this is a moment that we're watching all of our spaces close down. And what does it? How do like how do we reshift? How do we reprioritize? Um, the survival and the strength and the well-being for this, this the importance within our community. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, how how do we how do we relax <laughs> right now is a question. I don't know. Um, and yet, some people are relaxing, and some people are moving even faster than they were moving. Um, and yet, it feels like it's kind of beginning to hint at what. I don't know, how can, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, how can this kind of slowing down of production really benefit the well-being and the survival of us? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I think that leads really, it leads really well into this, this, uh, this question around designing collective repositories for grief and joy. What historical strategies and technologies have you used in developing your personal embodied relationship with grief? and with sadness. And uh, T, so much of your work is about uh, pulling the grief and the sadness and maybe it's also some of the fear, you know, right to your, right into your, your yourself, into your body so that you can understand how to, to move forward and how these technologies are moved towards freedom work. Can you talk a bit about historical technologies you employed? Um, for dealing with grief and uh, those were, yes. Um, I would say that um, black women have this thing where we come in together and we come in in circle amongst one, amongst, amongst each other and um, we, we sing and we wail and we cry and we grieve and um, that is, one one historic reference that I have that is what I'm used to seeing the the very strong women in my family my aunts my my cousins I come from um, a, a strong a, a family of women and um, there is this uh, practice of gathering at our grandmother's home and being amongst each other and giving each other the strength and the energy and uh, that that love to um, straighten up that backbone and <laughs> and keep going. But I do want to point out though that those some of those historic practices have also um, negatively impacted our mental health collectively as Black women. And one thing that I am learning, and one thing that my brother Ferrari Shepherd shared with me this past week, was that we don't all we don't we're not just going to survive, we don't only have to survive this pandemic, we need to thrive in it. We need to absolutely thrive right now. And we need to um, show up, we need to check on each other and we need to drink water <laughs> and we need to, um, we need to breathe. We, and, and we need to cry and we need to recognize that our mental health is our wealth and that it is okay to break down, it is okay to be weak. And we're often told, told you know, you're strong. Or, you know, I've, I've went through Hurricane Katrina and earthquakes, all these things, and I come out and they're like, oh, and T is gonna survive this because she has survived this and she has survived that. And, you know, yes, I have. And it is often neglected and, you know, dismissed how I have survived it and how I've come out of it. And that now I'm making the decision not to just survive, but thrive. And so when I'm in these circles with socially distanced from my aunts and my own mother, that we allow ourselves to cry and to breathe and to um, not be strong, to be weak and to completely just break down and let it go. Um, and be in this present moment that is not um, that just happens to be awful. Um, but taking it and accepting it as it is first and then acting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, pod mapping, you know, checking on your neighbors, keeping in contact with folks, 
Um, and, you know, this is a good one. Cannabis. Shout out to my comrade, Danya, for Ojos de la Sol. Mm-hmm. Um, Ojos de la Sol, like this cannabis app, you know, like treat your body well. So yeah. old yeah. and new. Got to mix it up. Yeah. Old medicine. Mother medicine. Old and medicine. To be, yeah. But to be undone with one another. We have that yeah. gift of doing that. Asia. Mm -hmm. Uh, for me, I had a friend who always said, you believe like the sky is falling. I was like, cause the sky has fallen a million times in my life. So I'm waiting for the next one, <laughs> you know? Um, so, um, yeah, every day was an emergency. So now it is taking a pause, breathing, sleeping, eating, drinking, celebrating. It's my third day of Eid. So this is my next Eid outfit, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so celebrating. My cousins in Saudi Arabia are in severe lockdown where they couldn't even get any food or anything. And so to see like the extreme crises of where my family, my uncles, my aunts in Africa, they're going through the floods and the locusts and all kinds of horrific things are happening. So to recognize that, um, you know, for right now, for those of you, this is your first time, you know, I always tell people I'm a veteran. So if you see me smiling, it's because I've been there, done that, you know, my house burned down twice. You know, I've been through the flood in Djibouti. There's a serious flood right now um, in Northeast Africa. And the last flood that happened 30 years ago, I was in that one, you know, that was just that bad that the whole city flooded. So, and then to just remember that you just connect with your people. It's love that got me through everything, you know, being so well loved by my mom, being so well loved by my community. So I say now I only go places where I'm loved. I respect myself, you know, and the way that I respect myself is if I recognize someone doesn't respect me or some community doesn't respect me, then I go off and build my own. So my mom always says, um, the revolution is that you exist. We're still here. They tried to kill us, but we're still here. Mm -hmm. And we're still joyful. So. Yes, mama. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I guess I'll hop in and just say I have my plant beside me, like a true millennial. <laughs> I've been um, doing a lot of uh, thinking about how I can get back to uh, you know, some things, yes, that my mother exposed me to early on um, that I love so much, like plants, flowers, um, photography, writing. Um, I've been getting into podcasts. I've been listening to albums and music that I didn't get around to during the semester. Um, I've been uh, reconnecting with family that I haven't spoken to in a while. I've been developing a much closer relationship with my sister who is actually in the thick of it um, in Brooklyn, New York. That's where she's she's based right now. So as, as well as other members of my family. Um, I lost a family member to COVID. So um, I, I'm very well aware of what many families are going through that have been um, kind of exposed to the, the worst of, of what this could be without maybe having symptoms or getting sick. Um, however, I have to say that even um, within this, um, the, the distance and the, you know, the anxiety that that brings um, means that we have to really support each other um, more, I think, and, and language is so critical our existence um, online and kind of connecting with each other through video, through phone calls, even letter writing. I received a, an amazing letter um, from someone who, uh, who, who practice, who's also a sort of arts pra practitioner in the Bay Area, um, acknowledging my grief and sending me condolences I've gotten a lot of support from uh, the women in the circle as well, uh, whether they know it or not. So um, I think that we we really have an opportunity to pay it forward in this in this situation. I think um, that's like sacred communication, mm -hmm. and it's it's invaluable. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, it speaks to our ability to design and to like increase our conjure capacity, you know, for these times. And, you know, as we respond to these opportunities, I mean, there is uh, an, a decrease for some people and an increase for others. You know, so my question to you all in regards to designing for collective joy, in addition to like being aware of the collective grief and, you know, we, we talk about, you know, living in uh, a woman body, living in a woman's body, living in a black queer woman's body, all of these layers of identity uh, add to our uh, ability to design even greater. So I, I, I just wanna invite this, this question for joy, you know, to be present here um, as we start to end our conversation and invite folks to put their last questions into the chat as well. Um, what does that look like to design for collective joy right now? I mean, I just wanna say that uh, during the semester, I was so joyful because my students in the darkest hours were making really incredible work. I could not have anticipated um, the fact that, yeah, it was, it was incredibly challenging for, for all of us, um, but they still pushed through and, and, and really um, made, made work that I don't, I don't think that they would have accomplished otherwise. Um, it is a testament to our tenacity um, and our, our strength and our, um, you know, yes, our survival, yes, but also our, our willingness to um, keep making as artists. Uh, they, as you all do in the circle, inspire me. So that brings me joy to have a, a kind of a, a purpose. I think um, when you lose track of your purpose, and in, in when the anxiety and all of the sort of walls kind of close in, then that gets difficult to ascertain. Okay, where do I go from here? Because you can start to feel kind of uh, paralyzed in in the moment um, because of many things that are extremely challenging. I don't have children. I don't. I don't have a spouse. I'm not a homeowner. So. There are some things that don't weigh down on me in the same way that it may um, other folks, but um, I, I think that the art is the the the, the ability to continue making um, within duress, within challenge, within you know grief, um, mourning. All, many of us lost shows and opportunities. Um, some of, in, in addition to being concerned about our health, our wellness, and our families. Um, so just um, that, that connection to our, our individual practices has brought me a lot of joy and inspired me to continue making. Thank you. I feel called to say some words by a huge inspiration and artist that we lost last week, Emma Amos. And this quote is up on my desktop, which I'll read it now and in my studio and it reads, for me, a black woman artist to walk into the studio is a political act. Um, and I say to walk into the studio, to walk into the dedication of being an artist and doing this work for our lives. Um, and yeah, I, I've, I, I, I hold that those words close to my heart um, and close to our, our survival that yes, this is a political act and this is also what we must do to maintain joy, to stay alive. Um, mm -hmm. That how do we, how do we tap in and, and feed ourselves? I say that like going to my studio or making art is like taking my vitamins um, and it brings me the most joy. It's my, my, my space to, to be myself within. Um, and also, I don't know, but I feel it it's kind of shared shared language in this in this circle, um, both here and also the circle of last week's discussion. Um, but 
yeah, how do we make space to to give ourselves power and to to feed our souls? Yes, and and to be free. Absolutely. Go ahead, go ahead, T. Absolutely, picking back onto what Lakeza just said, we as Black women have been indoctrinated with don't take up too much space. And I just want to say, continue to take up all the space. It's absolutely a, reg a revolutionary act to just be here um, and surviving during this pandemic. Um, it's a revolutionary act to stand behind women like Lava Thomas um, as the San Francisco Arts Commission totally um, just trashed her essentially and to take, you know, stand up and, you know, for the campaign with her and um, collectively um, join, you know, your your comrades and your women um, and fight for them and the, and recognize that that, you know, is also a part of maintaining joy, making sure that, you know, your counterparts, um, your comrades are not gone and invisible. There are many great, um, photographers in the Bay and artists in the Bay, females who just don't, do not have um, platform. And a part of collective joy for me is to making sure people like Tracy Barlow, Erica Demon um, have, have these platforms um, where their work is showcased. Um, writers, um, Lila Weaver, um, just all these, these, these incredible um, folks in the Bay and just, that's joy for me, seeing black women thrive and be supported and take up space and, and, and be here and be present. It's very, mm -hmm. makes me really happy. Gives me joy. I sure. So the last, the last part of our conversation uh, right now, uh, I'm gonna quote uh, Queen Mother writer, Toni Morrison, who says, or reminds us that the function of Freedom is to free somebody else, is to free someone else, yeah? And I'd love if we could close our conversation out with uh, your answer to does pleasure making and desire play a role in how you define freedom? Pleasure making and desire, how do they play a role if they do in your definition of freedom? Um, I will just say that I'm thinking of, of, of Toni Morrison definitely right now, but I'm also thinking of Audre Lorde, um, and, um, how she basically outlined how the, the, that, that being amongst black women is a pleasure center, <laughs> um, that, that, that within itself, the sort, of, the sort of knowledge that we have of each other, not in the sense that, you know, blackness is monolithic or uh, anything like that, but that within the diasporic quality of blackness and our connections to each other, that we can find comfort, we can find care, love, support, um, acknowledgement, um, not without the, necess the necessity to explain ourselves or answer um, <laughs> questions that um, we've had to um, advocate for ourselves about over and over again. I, I think that, um, you know, it, there is something to be able to dance and write and make amongst each other. Um, that that collectiveness is is a part of um, how I get free, uh, how I how I feel free. Um, but I also want to address that with, with within that within that sense that there's a range of emotions that come up between rage and joy. And so, who do we feel the most comfortable expressing? Um, the the spectrum of, of 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 joy and rage with for me it's not everybody <laughs> for me it's particularly black women that I feel the most comfortable um, discussing these um, these emotions with and so um, I, I I just I I feel that that that's kind of where I am with the pleasure center that I can be myself um, and that within my selfhood. I can find sanctuary. 
So that's that's what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. What comes to mind for me is, oh. Go ahead, go ahead, please. I was just um, thinking a little bit about what Sam said and what comes to mind when we use what I've read recently on Adrian Marie Brown, Pleasure Activism and Politics of Feeling Good and how uh, rethinking um, what that means. And for me, I find um, deep pleasure in, in activism. Um, and I know that that also can be somewhat um, a little bit complicated to understand or even for people who have experienced certain types of abuse, um, very complicated and um, unsettling. And But for me, I do find um, pleasure in activism and I do feel free through engaging in my community and seeing that uh, the folks in my community who are less fortunate are taken care of um, and are thought of and not invisibilized in the ways that I have felt um, invisibilized myself. So me next, okay. All right, so for me, it is a pleasure to get dressed. It is a pleasure to make artwork. It is a pleasure to live as I deem fit. Um, it, I feel free, completely free to do, you know, what it is that I feel my spirit draws me to. So when I say it's a pleasure to serve, it's a pleasure to serve with my friends. So in this time, um, I've begun to like commonize and realize I have such disparate connections and to bring them all together, being so intersectional, I, I think it's like my duty, you know, in this time as an artist to bring all of these people that are doing such fabulous things together. And even that we're so separated, it's like bringing uh, the group Beyond Return together with like pro arts, um, common, you know, commons and, you know, the Cottonist Grocery Co-op and the East Oakland Collective and the, even working with like the East Oakland New Co-op that's coming up. Um, and people hearing me, um, they heard me that I was going to open one. They were like, why don't we just unify our actions together so that we don't all have to be reinventing the wheel. So what gives me joy is not just work all the time, but coming fabulous, you know, to work, coming into it, you know, from a joyful position. My grandmother says, you know, when something is terrible, get away from it and dance. And so, you know, we dance as we do our work. And Lucasa. I have no words because you all have my words. Yes. But I will just add that, yeah, I think this, this work, what we're talking about today gives me pleasure. This being able to be in conversation with artists about how we're gonna survive and move forward um, and continue to breathe gives me deep pleasure. Being able to know that I can use my art form and my practice as a way of making change um, and yeah i'm i'll i'm 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 my pleasure my pleasure is feeling full at this moment i'm feeling so honored to have shared this space with all of us um and really do deep thinking about um about this moment about each other's practices and lives and um how we continue thriving and shining and mm -hmm. shining bright well it has been my pleasure my pleasure to to sit with you all just for a little bit uh to thank the sea black women collective and and to really consider what it means to be counted as we talked about at the top of the, the hour that this is part of a conversation called come to your senses, you know, and who counts in America and that we count. And so it's important that we continue to, to come to the table together, to come to the river together, to be in prayer and song and dance and wail and wail to understand that our voice counts and that our lives count. I guess I'll just close by asking, have you all done the census? Yes. Yes, you did the census. Yes. 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 We were counting. Yes. We did I'm still waiting on my sweatshirt for doing it. Oh. You did a sweatshirt? Okay. okay. Art and action. Better get on that. <laughs> oh yeah. I, I can give a I can give a shout out to that actually. Um, okay. Do it. Um. Yeah. Um. There there is a a a campaign that you can um become a part of um where 
if you filled out the census, you can get a sweatshirt um, from YBCA that comes in two different colors, I believe, uh, as long as you just sh uh, show them um, that that you that you've completed it. Um, so there's a team of artists that you know manifested this, uh, mm -hmm. and um, the the sweatshirt comes in both um, English and Spanish, and so uh, it promotes the fact that no no one is invisible, uh, not even if you are um, undocumented, you That's are right. not invisible. Uh, you can um, be a part of the census. So I want to I want to thank that team of, of artists for doing that work and also suggest that you, you know, look into the sweatshirt. <laughs> <laughs> and that you do the census. Yeah. So on that, I want to I want to thank our partners. I want to thank you all so much um, for your generosity and your vulnerability for coming with us on this experiment. Art in Action, which is Amy Kish and Brittany Thicken, the Curatorial Coalition for Come to Your Census, which includes myself, Amy, Brittany, Sarah Kathers, Martin Strickland, Candace Huey. Uh, it includes the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts and their serious badassery, their creative marketing and tech teams, including the folks who are managing the tech tonight. It includes the San Francisco Office of Civic Engagement and Immigrant Affairs. Big up to them. Our comrades at the Museum of the African mm -hmm. Diaspora, and uh, our joy, you know, expressed in them, you know, being able to really rock an online auction a couple of weeks ago. So excited for them. And then um, the Artists as First Responder, you know, platform and the collaborations with the Oakland Human Services Department and the Recast Grant, our friends and family at the African American Arts and Cultural Center in San Francisco, the Girls and Women of Color Collaborative, the Akinati Foundation the Culture Change Foundation at the Women's Foundation for California. Uh, and again, of all of you and, and our time here together. So. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thank you. Trust black women. Bye. Thank you everyone. Thank you for your time. Follow us at See Black Women.